Good afternoon, New Brunswick, and welcome to today's Neurological Syndrome Update with Health Minister Dorothy Shepard. We will also be hearing today from different VPs from both Horizon and Vitalite Health Network. Now, I know if any of you were following the news yesterday and this week, there seems to be more updates. There was an article published in The Walrus, that's a Canadian publication based in Toronto, looking into the neurological syndrome that uh, is happening in, in New Brunswick. There's been around eight deaths, I do believe, that are, are tied, that have been believed to be tied to this disease, but this article has shed some new light on, on maybe that there could potentially be different causes for the deaths of those individuals based on an autopsy. So we will be hearing from Minister of Health Dorothy Shepard today about that, um, and if there is any new information to be shared with us. There was also a study done um, that's ongoing about the different cases of this neurological syndrome that is mysterious and hopefully we'll be hearing whether or not there were some new information to be garnered from the studies that again are ongoing whether it is environmental factors to consider if you're following this neurological syndrome obviously they're in a, a very regional area of New Brunswick that they all seem to be clustered in so Obviously, there's something to look into there um, in, t in terms of finding out what common threads there could, could potentially be with all these cases and, and, and then what could be causing these cases. Again, it's still mysterious. It still uh, has garnered an international uh, spotlight because we don't seem to have any, any real clues about what this could be and, and then again what treatments there could be for it. And there have been deaths that have been believed to be tied to this syndrome, but again, we're expecting to have information today about whether or not these deaths now, um, based on new information that's been made available, um, are indeed tied to this illness or if they could be potentially due to other individual circumstances of the cases that were believed to be um, deceased because of the syndrome. It could be that um, they had other causes that were more personal. Again, I don't want to speculate too much before the conference begins. It sounds like we're about to go into the conference room. We've done the roll call already with the journalists. Now, if you are tuning in because you expect to have a COVID-19 update, I won't be surprised if Minister Shepard shares with us COVID numbers for the day at the start of the conference. That's normally something that Dr. Russell does when she's a part of this, but Dr. Russell will not be a part of this conference today. Again, it is the VP of both Vitalite and Horizon Health. It's a medical affairs department for both. Both of those VPs will be joining us. So different than last week, if you were watching on Friday's uh, conference with Dr. Dornan and Dr. Uh, De Rossier, those two doctors aren't joining us this time. It's a new, a new set of doctors uh, representing both of the health networks for the province. It sounds like we will be on time. So if you do have questions and you're following online, please feel free to share them with me here. Um, I, I haven't really decided what to ask yet. I RSVP'd late for this conference, um, so I think I will be Bonne near the end of, oh, oh, sounds like we're about to start. So I will see you after the conference. I'll be following along online. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this update on the potential neurological syndrome of unknown cause. Speaking of following order this afternoon are the Honorable Dorothy Shepard, Minister of Dr. Erfa Rahman, Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Natalie Bonville, President of Medical Affairs for Vitalite Health Network, and Dr. Susan Breen, Vice President, Medical Academic and Research Affairs. Horizon Health Network. Les porte-paroles aujourd'hui dans les suivants sont l'honorable Dorothy Shepard, ministre de la Santé, la médecin hygiéniste Erfa Rahman, la vice-présidente médicale de réseau de santé et vitalité, Dr. Natalie Bonville. I apologize just for the quick technical difficulty. We'll be heading back into the conference room in just a matter of moments for the update. When I get a cue from our back room that the conference room is ready for us again, I will send the video feedback there. But as I mentioned, if you're following online, please feel free to write your comments and questions down for oh, Minister Shepard and the representatives from Vitalite and Horizon Health for me to ask in the conference. Um, I will be pivoting based on the information that's shared and I'll see you after the conference. Here's Minister Shepard. Bon après-midi à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon. 
Before I begin my official remarks, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Natalie Banville, Vice President of Medical Affairs for Vitalite Health Network, Dr. Susan Breen, Vice President, Medical, Academic and Research Affairs for Horizon Health Network, and Dr. Arifer Rahman, Medical Officer of Health, for joining me this afternoon. Earlier this year, in the month of June, the Government of New Brunswick and I, as Minister of Health, committed to keeping New Brunswickers informed when we had information to share about public health's investigation into the potential neurological illness of unknown cause. I am here this afternoon with the experts to fulfill that commitment by providing an important update. As a reminder, public health investigation is being carried out concurrently by two different teams in two parts, the epidemiological review and the clinical review. One team is tasked with exploring the epidemiolog epidemiology of the cluster to explore potential risk factors and exposures. The other team is the clinical team. This oversight committee is made up of six neurologists expressly formed to review the complete clinical history and diagnosis of each patient in the group. The oversight committee expects to be able to complete its review and submit a report early in the new year. And I look forward to sharing the results of the investigation when they become available. Much has been written and shared about the potential causes of this possible mysterious illness since it first came to light publicly. Before I turn it over to Dr. Raman, I would like to take this opportunity to share further relevant information with you. Dans le cadre des sept enquêtes, nous avons découvert des lacunes dans les processus de signalement qui ont aggravé la situation, souvent sans aucune surveillance. During this investigation, we found gaps in the reporting process that allowed the situation to escalate, often without oversight. I will also share the autopsy results of eight cases referred to the CJDSS from this cluster. But first, a timeline of events. Despite CJDSS's ongoing investigation into a small group of individuals referred by, the, by a New Brunswick neurologist, it didn't inform our public health department until December of 2020. Now alerted, public health officials reached out to partners at the Public Health Agency of Canada and others. In February, public health started asking for status report on the autopsies, and these requests continued for months. In April, public health informed its federal counterparts at the Public Health Agency of Canada that the CJDSS said it would no longer participate in weekly information gathering meetings with the province. On July 30th, CJDSS released the names of 48 members of the cluster to validate information obtained by Public Health New Brunswick. At the end of August, Dr. Gerald Jansen, a neuropathologist at the Eastern Ontario Regional Laboratory Association, presented his autopsy results to the Oversight Committee. Since those results were not shared with public health, the province requested a status update on September the 7th. Public health finally received the autopsy results on September 24th, a total of seven months after its first request back in February. Plus tôt aujourd'hui, j'ai envoyé une lettre au ministère fédéral de la Santé, Jean-Yves Duclos. Earlier today, I wrote a letter to the Federal Minister of Health, Jean-Yves Duclos. I congratulated him on his new appointment, and most importantly, I highlighted the difficulties we faced during this investigation and that no jurisdiction should ever go through this type of situation. Here is what I can tell you about the autopsy results. Since 2019, eight deceased patients referred to the CJDSS have undergone autopsies. Six of these eight patients are included 
in the cluster of 48 cases under investigation. Two others have been flagged by the referring physician to CJDSS as additional cases related to this potential mysterious illness. On October 7th, Dr. Jansen published the findings on the website of the Canadian Association of Neuropathologists. There was one case of metastatic carcinoma, one case of FD, FTLD-TDP43, a leading cause of dementia after Alzheimer's disease, one case of neurocortical Lewy body pathology, one case of neurocortical Lewy body pathology and Alzheimer's disease two cases of Alzheimer's disease with vascular pathology, one case of mainly vascular pathology, and one case without significant pathology consistent with patients' previous history. And I would like to quote from Dr. Gerald Jansen of the CJDSS. Quote, in these eight patients, no evidence for a prion disease was found, nor novel pathology. We suggest that these eight patients represent a group of misclassified clinical diagnoses." End quote. Dr. Jansen has been involved with clinical surveillance of Kruschevelt Jacobs disease for more than 30 years and has been the national neuropathologist responsible for this type of surveillance for a total of 26 years, 11 years for the Netherlands and Belgium and 15 years in Canada. While I'm not going to predetermine the outcome of the clinical investigation, I do think we are getting closer to a determination. I also believe public health has significant reason to question the validity of an unknown neurological illness. And I believe they implemented the scientific and methodical process to ensure affected patients, their families, and all of New Brunswickers could have confidence in the results. Lastly, I want to close by saying something to the patients and families. We know this has been and continues to be an emotional, difficult and trying time for everyone. The clock has not stopped on our work. The Oversight Committee has committed to completing its work as expeditiously as possible and I look forward to receiving it and sharing it with the families and the public in the early new year. Thank you. Merci. Good afternoon. Unusual illnesses such as those that are known but are not expected to occur in New Brunswick or those identified to be of an unknown cause are notifiable events under the New Brunswick Public Health Act. Provincial health officials have the mandate to investigate and control human illness outbreaks that occur within their boundaries. This is so public health can further investigate these cases, both from a clinical and an epidemiological perspective to further assess any risks to the population. Occurrence of a new or a rare disease or a change in the pattern of disease in an area is likely to prompt an investigation. The primary steps in investigating a cluster of cases such as this involve verifying diagnosis through clinical review and performing descriptive epidemiology. This is precisely what Public Health New Brunswick has done as part of our investigation. Once these two components of the investigation are completed, studies such as laboratory or environmental studies can be completed 
to further investigate those exposures that have been identified as potential causes. Enhanced epidemiological surveys and medical and clinical reviews are the quintessential first steps required to form hypotheses around potential causes and the need to research these identified areas of concern in greater detail. This afternoon, I am sharing with you the results of the epidemiological investigation. Copies of the report will be made available online after this afternoon. But first, let me begin my presenting by presenting some background information. Back in 2015, a neurologist in New Brunswick referred a case to CJDSS the Kutzfeld disease surveillance system. The CJDSS is managed by the Public Health Agency of Canada and performs nationwide monitoring for human prion disease, which cause neurologic manifestations. Five years later in 2019, the same neurologist referred 12 more cases. Another 25 cases were referred in 2020. And 10 more cases in 2021, resulting in a total of 48 cases. 46 of these 48 were referred by one neurologist, and two other neurologists referred one case each. All of these cases presented with symptoms atypical of Kutzfeldt disease all of the individuals tested negative for known forms of human prion disease. Due to similarities in clinical presentation, the cluster was identified in January of this year as a potential neurological syndrome of unknown cause. The epidemiology and surveillance branch of Public Health New Brunswick, along with Dr. Russell, the chief medical officer, of health, medical officer of health, and other experts in the field, and myself launched an investigation. We consulted with subject matter experts from across the country to develop an enhanced surveillance questionnaire. These experts came from various departments within the Public Health Agency of Canada, including outbreak management, the National Microbiology Laboratory, and Kutzfeldt Jacob Disease Surveillance System. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency also was consulted. The epidemiology team also consulted the British Columbia Center for Disease Control, as well as provincial organizations in New Brunswick, such as the Departments of Agriculture, aquaculture and fisheries, environment and local dev go uh, government, natural resources and energy development. The purpose of this survey was to cast a wide net to try to formally identify commonalities amongst the 48 individuals in the cluster and to ask questions they may not have been asked in a clinical setting. A combination of closed and open-ended questions touched on the following topics related to demographics, food exposures, environmental exposures, occupational and work details, recreational exposures, as well as close contact and family exposures. Participants had an opportunity to add any additional information they thought could be relevant to their symptoms. Of the 48 cases, 34 completed the interview process. The respondents could be individual identified in the cluster, their proxies, or the individual with the support of their proxies during the questioning. Of the remaining 14 cases, nine chose not to be interviewed. The interviews began in May and were completed last month. We will share some of the results now. 
it is important from the outset to consider the small sample size of 34 people when making conclusions about food safety and other potential exposures in this report. 22 of the cases were in the mountain area, the zone one health region. One was in Miramichi zone, eight in Acadie Bathurst zone, and two in the St. John area of zone two. One case indicated they were living in Ontario at the time of onset and later moved to New Brunswick. But their responses are included in the investigation. The researchers noted in the report that this distribution of cases corresponds to the catchment area of the practices of the referring neurologists. A call was made inviting neurologists and other physicians from surrounding areas and from across the country to submit referrals of patients with similar symptoms to this cluster. Not one was submitted. Most respondents said their most common environmental and recreational exposure was the ocean. Food exposures were also typical of the maritime coast. The most common food was lobster, 31 out of 34 people. That means 1% reported eating it in the last two years, leading up to the onset of symptoms. Second was blueberries, followed up by scallops, prawn, or shrimp. Much further down, the list is moose. Less than half of the respondents had eaten it within two years of symptoms, and only six had eaten deer meat. And while the individuals said they bought locally, the item were not necessarily locally produced. Most bought their food at chain stores, and close to 70% didn't know if what they bought was local or imported. This meant the source of the lobster, scallops, prawn, or shrimp bought at the chain stores were likely unknown. We have concluded there is an overarching theme to these findings, which is if a particular food exposure, such as lobster or blueberries or venison was to blame, there would have been people with similar symptoms in other parts of the province, or in the neighboring provinces, or in Maine, where all these foods are common. This hasn't happened. And based on the findings of this report, there are no specific behaviors, foods, or environmental exposures that can be identified as risk factors with regards to the potential syndrome of unknown cause. Thank you. Bon après-midi à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon. Le gouvernement provincial a annoncé le 3 juin dernier qu'il formait un comité de surveillance pour examiner les travaux cliniques et l'enquête associée à un syndrome neurologique de cause inconnue. Le comité de surveillance est coprésidé par moi-même, Dr Nathalie Banville, du Réseau de santé et vitalité, et par Dr Susan Breen, du Réseau de santé Horizon. Dr. Breen a récemment remplacé Dr. Edward Hendricks, qui vient de prendre sa retraite. En plus des deux coprésidents, le comité est formé de six neurologues et d'un médecin hygiéniste de santé publique, Dr. Raman. Le mandat du comité consiste à mener une étude clinique, des dossiers médicaux et des observations concernant les personnes atteintes visées par l'enquête, des données pertinentes extraites des questionnaires remplis par leurs fournisseurs de soins, 
des renseignements obtenus dans le système de surveillance de la maladie de Crucifel jacob Déterminer les patients ou les sous-groupes de patients qui pourraient devoir être interrogés de nouveau et subir d'autres examens et, et, ou évaluations et passer d'autres tests. Repérer les lacunes dans les dossiers électroniques médicaux et recommander des améliorations à apporter. Réviser la définition des cas et formuler des recommandations si des changements sont app apportés. Déterminer s'il est nécessaire, le cas échéant, de procéder à d'autres tests de laboratoire de pathologie sur des échantillons humains, y compris des recommandations sur la nature des tests à, à réaliser et des tests d'échantillons à prélever. Examiner les recherches qui sont susceptibles d'être pertinentes. Le comité a pris soin de mettre sur pied un processus d'examen objectif sans parti pris qui respecte les normes scientifiques élevées. Puisqu'il y a eu du retard, des retards dans l'obtention des dossiers et des renseignements médicaux du neurologue principal à l'origine des signalements et du système de surveillance de la maladie crucifel jacob les premiers cas n'ont commencé à être examinés qu'au début du mois d'août. Les neurologues examinent chaque cas en paire à tour de rôle et par la suite présentent aux autres neurologues les trouvailles afin d'obtenir leurs commentaires et d'en discuter en groupe. À la conclusion de l'examen clinique de chaque cas, les neurologues soumettront un rapport par écrit. Dans certains cas, avant de soumettre un rapport clinique final, les neurologues pourraient recommander que d'autres examens soient effectués ou pourraient demander de voir le patient en personne pour une évaluation supplémentaire. Le comité peut également communiquer avec d'autres médecins traitants ou d'autres spécialistes au besoin. Les neurologues se serviront de cette méthode pour passer en revue tous les 48 cas qui faisaient partie de la grappe de, de départ. Je passe maintenant la parole au Dr Susan Breen afin qu'elle puisse vous donner plus d'informations sur l'état d'avancée des travaux du comité. Merci beaucoup. Bon après-midi à toutes et à tous. Good afternoon. To date, 38 of the 48 cases have been assigned to the neurologist for review. As case reviews are completed, the Oversight Committee will be sending letters to each patient and or their families with information from the review. The committee will also be sending a letter to the primary physician on file highlighting any unknown syndromes or known conditions and recommendations from the review. To date, there has been no evidence of unknown syndromes identified in the autopsy reports. It is anticipated that the clinical review of all 48 cases will be completed early in the new year followed by the release of a final report of the findings in the following weeks. On behalf of myself and my co-chair, Dr. Bonville, I would like to personally thank the neurologists who are working diligently to complete these reviews while maintaining their practices and on-call responsibility. Thank you, merci. Their expertise and commitment to providing answers to those who are part of this investigation and to the concerned citizens of New Brunswick is to be commended. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Doctor, Doctor, Doctor. Merci beaucoup à vous, vous quatre. We'll now proceed with questions from members of the media. Each member of the media will have one question and a follow-up question. 
You have the right to pose your question in the official language of your choice. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux périodes de questions avec les membres de Média. Vous avez le droit de poser votre question dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Chaque journaliste aura une question et un suivi. This afternoon, we are going to start with Jennifer Baza from CTV. Hi, can you? Jennifer, a little closer to your microphone, please. Jennifer, we think you muted yourself. Jennifer, we can't hear you. We'll, we'll cycle back to you. On va maintenant procéder avec Maude Montambo de Radio Canada. Allô? Oui, bonjour. Bon, deux questions. Euh, alors, la première, si la cause alimentaire est écartée, environnementale et la maladie inconnue est écartée, est-ce que Mme Banville, vous pourriez nous dire quelles sont maintenant les autres hypothèses pour euh, les malades qui sont en attente d'éclaircissement? Mademoiselle Montembo, peux-tu répéter la question comme il faut, s'il vous plaît? Oui, avec plaisir. Ma que première question pour Mme Banville. J'aimerais savoir, puisque vous écartez les causes alimentaires, environnementales et inconnues, quelles sont maintenant les autres hypothèses pour les malades qui sont en attente d'éclaircissement? Il va y avoir des communications faites aux malades et aux médecins responsables. Présentement, je ne suis pas neurologue, je ne peux pas donner de réponse, d'hypothèse aux, aux patients. Mademoiselle Montembeau, as-tu une deuxième question? Oui, pour Madame Shepard, vous nous avez décrit l'historique euh, de votre collaboration avec l'Agence de santé du Canada. Pourriez-vous nous qualifier la relation que vous avez maintenant? Alors, comment pourriez-vous qualifier la collaboration et la relation que vous avez avec vos homologues euh, à, à Ottawa? Et qu'est-ce que précisément vous demandez au ministre Duclos? Merci pour la question. Um, the rapport est bien. C'est une relation professionnelle et nous sommes en contact avec Public Health Agency du Canada extrêmement régulièrement sur beaucoup, beaucoup de différents sujets. Ce que nous avons identifié à travers tout ce processus, c'est que nous avons des gaps. Et nous avons des gaps ici au Nouveau-Brunswick, nous avons des gaps de New Brunswick, we have gaps from New Brunswick à Ottawa, et je pense qu'il y a une bonne opportunité et une bonne opportunité pour nous de les adresser ensemble. I think there's ownership in, in all of this for um, both of us to understand what those gaps are and to ensure that we provide a mechanism by which we can fix them. Merci, Mademoiselle Montembeau. Merci, Ministre. Simon de Latte, L'Acadie Nouvelle. Oui, j'aimerais savoir, il y a plusieurs patients qui ont exprimé leur frustration. Ils jugent qu'il y a eu un manque de transparence jusqu'à présent. Ils ont estimé qu'il y avait eu peu de communication qui avait été, qui avait été, qui leur a été adressée. Est-ce que vous planifiez d'être en contact plus régulier avec, avec les patients qui ont, qui ont beaucoup de questions, je pense? The process is difficult for anyone who's waiting for answers, and I fully recognize that. What we felt was very important was that we needed to do a preliminary investigation. It's the responsibility of New Brunswick Public Health to do the preliminary investigation that validates a, pot a potential unknown syndrome uh, in a cluster of those cases, or if there are other Um, other diagnoses that have um, that have not happened. 
And so that's why this very methodical and scientific process was put in place. And, um, and so for the families who are waiting, we know that this has been difficult. If I can say that there is but one silver lining, it is that all of these 48 cases now have the benefit of a second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth assessment by which to, um, by which to uh, clear a path forward. And if we find at the end of this that there is indeed a cluster of unknown cases, um, uh, of neurological cases, we will go further. But this is a very important preliminary investigation that should have been done. Monsieur de la Tatou, suivi. Oui, donc vous avez expliqué qu'il y aura plusieurs évaluations qui suivront. Euh, pour clarifier, est-ce que le, lorsque cette, cette étude euh, par le comité de surveillance sera rendue euh, en, au début de l'année prochaine, euh, est-ce qu'il y aura d'autres étapes après celle-là euh, Et est-ce que, est que vous estimez que le, le Nouveau-Brunswick a suffisamment d'expertise et de ressources pour euh, mener cette, euh, cette enquête Thank you. Merci. Since the beginning of, um, of understanding um, when public health was notified in December of 2020, um, it was very important to understand what needed to be done in order to um, establish the fact that we have a cluster of, uh, of um, neurological conditions of unknown etology. And so that's why these, these steps have been put in place. At that time, we've certainly had the expertise from across the country, not only from government organizations um, nationally, but six different departments here in the province. This uh, epidemiological survey was an enhanced survey designed by scientists and, uh, and delivered um, with, through public health nurses um, who are very uh, experienced at deriving information from patients. So, I believe we have utilized every piece of expertise that we've needed. We can certainly um, um, get any kind of expertise we need um, with phone calls. It is, uh, you know, we know that we are a big medical community, uh, not just Canada, but globally. And so we will never hesitate to reach out to, uh, to garner expertise where we can. And as for going further, that's what this process is all about. This process is about doing that preliminary work done to understand how far we need to go with this and to determine what our next steps are. Thank you. Carissa Duncan, let's see. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, my question is for the minister. Minister, you just walked us through some of the timeline on this, but I just wanted to run this by you. We go back in time to March and we look at the memo that was sent out uh, by the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health at that time. It says, and I'm going to quote from it, preliminary investigation conducted in late 2019, early 2020, determined this to be a distinct atypical neurological syndrome. And then on March 18th, Dr. Russell says it most likely is a new disease. And now it seems like we're, uh, we're questioning the validity, validity of it. So, can you please outline for me why then public health seemed more certain at the time back in March that we were dealing with something new and unknown and what due diligence, due diligence excuse me, did public health do before that memo was sent out and before Dr. Russell made that statement in March? The information that we received from the Public Health Agency of Canada um, alluded to the fact that we had um, a cluster of neurological conditions of unknown etology, of, of unknown re reasons. And so based on that, that's how public health moved forward. So as we unraveled much of the information exchange that did or didn't happen um, locally and nationally, that's when we began to see that a very preliminary structure 
of understanding what we were actually dealing with really had not happened. And so this is science 101. This is what needs to happen in order to understand what we are truly dealing with. Ms. Donkin, do you have a follow up? Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, could could some of that information have been uncovered prior to sending that memo out? I mean, certainly this affects a lot of families. It affects a lot of communities. Um, people are quite scared. So I guess let me ask you this. What would you do differently if, if we were able to time work back to March? I think on that I can give you some definitive um, uh, suggestions that we've all, we've uncovered already. First, that referring physicians must inform Public Health New Brunswick of their referrals to CJDSS. Um, as a backup to that, that Public Health Agency of Canada and CJDSS uh, confirm with Public Health that they have received referrals. And all of this can be done without an exchange of patient information. So that's certainly one of the things and two of the things that I think we could do going forward that would really help um, all jurisdictions um, benefit from, uh, you know, from a more smoother process. Thank you both. Jennifer Baza, CTV. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, a little louder, please, and that would be just splendid. Okay. Uh, I apologize if I am, am repeating a question. I'm uh, unfortunately I don't speak French, so uh, my apologies in advance if this is the case. Um, so, according to an article published by the Walrus uh, experts that were working on a, a national committee, were told to stand down in June of this year. Why is that? Um, I'm just going to say that it is our understanding that we received word from CJDSS um, that um, that physicians from that direction would no longer be participating in our weekly meetings. So never at any time did we not welcome input. What we did realize was that New Brunswick had a responsibility to investigate these cases because it was the only province affected. And so the process dictates that the, the jurisdiction with the problem takes the lead and does all of the preliminary investigation. And if that investigation says we need to go further with um, expertise outside of the province, um, you know, if, if this had a national impact or if it had um, cases in other provinces, this would then become the venue for Public Health Agency of Canada. That wasn't the case. All of the cases were in New Brunswick. And therefore, it was Public Health New Brunswick's responsibility to take the lead. Ms. Baza, do you have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, where would you say at this point, um, what would you, if you had a message to say to the family members affected by this and those um, currently living with uh, these conditions, uh, what, what would a message you say to them be? The message is that we, we know you're hurting. We know that you want answers. And we hope to give you some of those answers. But without the team, the, the task, uh, I call them a task force, without the, the oversight committee doing their work, we can't begin to put you on a path. The good thing is, is that each family, each patient is, has now the benefit of six neurologists reviewing their case. And so we'll take some comfort from that, that, that there will be resolutions. And I cannot predetermine the outcome of the Oversights Committee, but what I can say is that as soon as we have that report, we will be back in the early new year to convey that um, to them and then to the public. Thank you. Angela Gilbert, CBC. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, Minister. I, my question is for you. Um, you've mentioned multiple times that public health only became aware of the notion of a cluster in December 2020 and referenced multiple times that there was only one referring neurologist in 46 of the 48 cases. And you've also said that there were communication and reporting gaps that have been identified in this process. My question uh, is based on the fact that we have government documents showing that doctors Legier, Smadi, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced that, and Muick attended a meeting on the investigation of a possible prion disease cluster with Dr. Marrero and CJDSS officials as far back as January 2020. Um, so my question is, why is public health suggesting now that they didn't know there were these cases sent off to Ottawa or that there was an emerging concern? I'm going to have to get public health to confirm this. My suggestion is that a, a prion disease was excluded as the cause. And so if they were investigating a prion disease, they were not investigating uh, an unknown neurological syndrome. Right, I think early on they thought that it may be a novel prion disease, which is the distinction there. And that would have been back at the time of January, 2020 when public health and Marrero and CJDSS were discussing this. So we'll have to get you some more information. I'm not, um, I'm not a clinician, so I don't want to interpret something incorrectly, but we will definitely follow up on your question and get you an answer. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. We're going to go to... I do have, sorry, oh, I do have my, my follow-up. My apologies. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we touched on the fact that the report repeatedly points to a single referring neurologist in 46 of the cases. Um, and I, I know, you know, regardless of this question around whether or not public health is acknowledging that they were in these meetings early on in 2020, we do see public health, um, you know, signing off on the full case definition and all of that. So I'm just wondering, when public health has been witnessing Dr. Marrero's concerns and work around this for the last two years, how is it that we are now seeing this distancing from him by public health now? The important part of the preliminary research is to validate whether or not we have an unknown neurological syndrome. And so, the fact is, is that we have just stated facts. 46 of the 48 referred cases are from one neurologist. And so we also know that any others that may come forward have also come from one neurologist. So we need to make this bigger than just one neurologist. It's not about trying to um, put anyone at arm's length, but an independent uh, unbiased oversight committee needs to do their work so that we can validate the find or see if there's something else um, that uh, see if there is another diagnosis. Thank you. Sarah Seeley, Brunswick News. So uh, my question is for Mr. Shepard. Uh, I was just wondering, um, are you given the, the timeline of, of kind of how things have unfolded over the past uh, summer? And I was just wondering why uh, more information about these uh, possible misdiagnoses wasn't um, uh, given to the families or like, as, as a whole that, that the possibility that this was going on. That's part of the process that we have found challenging. Um, the autopsy reports have been posted online. We found that by accident. We didn't know they were online. So we, we would expect that if we got information and the, and the referring physician had information that it would be, it would be taken to, to the families. It is a referring res physician's responsibility to communicate with families. So as the committee is doing their work, we have committed that if anything arises from that work, families will be contacted. But with regards to information that is out there, 
that the government of New Brunswick or the Department of Health or the regional health authorities do not control. We don't control that, you know? So that's one of the reasons why today is so important because there was so much information floating out there um, that we hadn't completely delineated yet. Um, it would, it's unfair for us not to make sure that we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's. That's the responsibility that we have to these families. And so I, I can't say why others have done what they've done. Um, and, and, and the public and the media are always going to be asking questions. We need to validate what we're giving to the public before we do that. Sarah, do you have a follow up? Uh, I was also wondering about um, uh, the fear that's been kind of created and generated in the community and, and how um, maybe um, the Department of Health uh, could have, uh, I guess, um, I guess countered that fear um, that was going on um, when there was this uh, unknown neurological uh, condition being studied. That was the whole purpose for the research and for the um, epidemiological enhanced survey and for the oversight committee's work. It's, um, it's very prudent that we take this, this time to ensure that all of these cases have been investigated properly. And um, if we have an unknown syndrome, then at least we know what we're dealing with. And if we don't, then we have to quell those fears. We owe it to New Brunswickers to let them know that they live in a safe province. And at this time, we, um, you know, at this time, we know that there is no behavioral, environmental, or food exposures that are putting New Brunswickers at risk. That's good information. And it couldn't have been done without a methodical and scientific uh, approach to doing it. Remember when we did this, when we launched the committee, we asked for seven months. Thank you. Steve McKinley with the Toronto Star. Sorry, I had to demute myself. Um, questions for Minister Shepherd again. Um, and, and it has to do with the transparency. And over and over again, you've promised the families that uh, they would be in the loop every step of the way. Uh, that's clearly not the case. Um, families of the deceased are finding out through the media that the diagnosis has been changed without their knowledge. Um, given that you've promised again and again, you know, first of all, whose responsibility is it to fulfill that promise that you made? And second, uh, will you commit to allowing doctors who have apparently are saying that they've been muzzled, they're not allowed to speak, will you commit that to allowing them to speak? I'll answer the second part first. I'm not aware of any doctor that's been muzzled. I've heard and seen many of them in the media recently speaking. Um, and whose responsibility is it? I'm going to probably defer to my, you know, my, uh, my medical experts who are here today to answer that. But I, I will say that as this process has unfolded, we, we need to validate the information before we bring it to the public or the patients. It, if we don't validate that information, we are not being responsible. It takes a longer process. And so I can't control what is put online. I can't control other agencies. And I can't control um, any individual who may speak out. What I can do is, when I, is, is commit that when our information is validated, it will be conveyed to families, to patients, of course, and then to the public. And I'll just ask if any of our experts here would like to comment on, on how families are are, uh, are given information. Je vais répondre en français. Habituellement, le processus, quand un médecin demande une autopsie, le médecin reçoit le résultat d'autopsie. Oui, l'hôpital reçoit exactement au même moment une copie de le, du résultat, mais c'est la responsabilité de, du médecin traitant, de, requérant, de communiquer les résultats de l'autopsie aux patients. L'hôpital ne peut le faire, c'est un bris de confidentialité, 
ce qui, demeure, qui est entre un patient et son médecin demeure la relation médecin-patient. Mr. McKinley, do you have a follow-up? Uh, yeah, first of all, my apologies. Could somebody uh, maybe give me the gist of that in English? I'm not a very good French speaker, unfortunately. It is the responsibility of the referring physician when he or she receives the report of an autopsy to share that information directly with the patient and the family. The hospital or regional health authorities have no authority to disclose that confidential information. Mr. McKinley, your follow-up? Yeah, um, again, for the minister, uh, did you or any member of your ministry um, ask scientists to stop testing for BMAA in the spring of this year? Can Not to my knowledge. It, I'm Mr. sorry. McKinley, can you can you explain that BM? Can yes, you, I actually don't even know what you're referring can you, to. Can you expand on your question and give us the full name of that? Uh, okay, BMA stands for beta methylamino L alanine. Uh, it's an amino acid uh, generally produced by cyanobacteria. It's been uh, fingered as a cause of um, various neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, I can I can only say no on my part and not on my not to my knowledge on behalf of the department. Thank you, Mr. McKinley. We will now turn to Ross Lord of Global TV. Thank you. I'd like to know, uh, Minister, if you look at where New Brunswick is today with where you were, I don't know, a year, a year and a half ago with this. Um, is there reassurance to be ahead here with the evidence that there might not be a mystery disease or is there more confusion and frustration over what you call gaps in the system, which are clearly frustrating to you? So from the time that public health was um, was informed of, of, of the neurological condition of unknown uh, causes in December of 2020, we put together um, an enhanced epidemiological, uh, epidemiological survey. That survey, I believe, was complete um, in June, maybe July, sorry, I'm not sure of the dates. Um, and that's the initial report that we, we brought forward for discussion today. It shows, or it, con it, 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 it concludes that there are no behavioral, environmental, or food um, conditions that needs to worry New Brunswickers. The clinical survey, which didn't begin until August, um, will be completed, uh, we feel, in the early new year, January 2020. And, or tw I'm sorry, 2022. <laughs> and um, and so these cases have had, uh, you know, are, are having the benefit of having six uh, neurological or neurologists review these cases, along with their whole caseload, as well that they have been juggling, and uh, and we're dealing through a pandemic. So I don't know that this could have moved any faster. And um, and so I think that all of the, you know, all of all of the steps that have been taken have been methodical, and um, and well thought out by public health and the oversight committee, with the help of Dr. Banville and Dr. Breen, and I don't believe it could work any faster than it has, and even a referral to a neurologist in the province can sometimes take up to six months, and so if we look from July until January. I believe we've um, will be completing that oversight in 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 very good time. Mr. Okay, Lord, do you have a follow up? Yeah, it's it's kind of um, related to the first one because I wasn't asking about the speed of things. I was asking if uh, you know you're left with reassurance, or New Brunswickers ought to be left with reassurance, 
or more concern or frustration because of some of these gaps in the system? Sorry, I understand. Um, there are gaps in the system. We've, we've shown that throughout this time. Um, the assurance I want New Brunswickers to have is when the oversight committee puts its, 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 its report forward that, that they can, they can um, have comfort in, in their findings and know that they're, they're valid. That's why this process was so important. I am not a clinician. I don't know what they know. I can't do what they do. I can only empower them to do the job that needs to be done. And so that we can have confidence in what they bring forward. Janet Godin, Radio Canada. Monsieur Godin. Tom Bateman, Brunswick News. Hi there, can you all hear me? Yes, Mr. Bateman. Great. Uh, yeah, Minister Shepard, uh, I also want to ask about those gaps that you referred to earlier. What exactly do you mean by those gaps? What, what are they? And how did they hinder the process that we've arrived at today? So some of the gaps that we recognize um, that have created uh, delays is that first off, um, when a referred physician refers to the CJDSS, um, um, we are it is reliant upon the physician to let public health know that that has happened. CJDSS does not inform public health New Brunswick that such inquiries are taking place. Um, and there's ways to do that without, you know, with, without um, um, disrespecting public, private, or private uh, confidential medical health information. results until Dr. Jansen had actually provided a verbal briefing to the oversight committee and then to public health and then we received um, we received the information on the uh, on the autopsy results we didn't know that the autopsy results were posted online so there are several gaps where information could have been exchanged in a must, much faster way we didn't even get to confirm the 48 cases of the identities until the end of July, even though we had been going back and forth. Those are the difficulties that we, we had in this exchange of information. And I believe there's an opportunity for Public Health Agency of Canada, CJDSS, and the province of New Brunswick to, um, to implement policies that will make it better for all jurisdictions. Mr. Bateman, a follow-up? Yes, thank you. Uh, this would be for some of the other experts in the room. Uh, what kind of evidence or new information would have to come from the clinical survey or other inquiries in order to reverse the conclusion of the report released today, which you know, I haven't had a chance to read yet? You know, so, so in other words, how final is the conclusion today that there's no food or environmental factor behind the illnesses that, that we're discussing? The review process of the Oversight Committee is designed for physici expert physicians to gather to review the clinical cases um, 
and to make uh, decisions and bring together a written report. And that we hope to finish that very soon so that we can communicate this important information to patients and their families. Thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand that answer in the context of the question. You know, can, can I just clarify, you know, like, like to what level of certainty or, you know, you know, how final is, is this conclusion? In what context, Mr. Bateman? Minister Shepard is coming, thank you. I think I can answer this for you, Tom, because it's kind of a question that I've had as well. So if I was, um, um, if the epidemiological enhanced survey is in, re it's an exploratory tool by which we can, you know, this, this part of it's finished and it's handed over to the clinical team. And so if the clinical team decides that more needs to be done, that they want to travel down a path based on information within that, that or based on the information they're gathering on the clinical side, then they will come back and say, we need to do more. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah that helps. Thank you, Minister. Monsieur Jeannick Godin, Radio-Canada. Oui, bonjour. Bonjour. La question euh, est pour euh, Madame Banville. Euh, S'il vous plaît, en français, pourriez-vous nous dire quelle est la, la, la suite des choses à partir de maintenant? Quelles seront les étapes qu'on va euh, suivre pour euh, continuer l'analyse euh, et évaluer là, complètement les, les hypothèses par rapport à la maladie inconnue, s'il y en a une ou non, en fait? Comme nous l'avons dit, nous allons compléter l'étude des cas avec les neurologues. Nous, nous avons pas complété l'étude de tous les cas encore. Il y a certains cas qui ont commencé à être révisés. On a, euh, il y a 48 cas à analyser complètement. Avant de faire des hypothèses, nous devons terminer le travail complètement. Merci. Monsieur Godin, as-tu suivi? Non, ça va, merci. Merci beaucoup. Vicky Hogar, CHCO TV. Hi, I'm wondering at this point, I know you're ruling out food and environmental factors, but have you determined any common threads that you're still investigating um, that are suspicious? And if so, what are they? Hi. Um, so the epidemiological findings have shown there is no specific behaviors or food or environmental exposure that was identified uh, as a potential risk factors. And uh, during this process, um, we included um, their food, what they regularly eat, and the environment they're exposed to, and also their occupation. And uh, um, the list was very um, uh, exhaustive, and uh, we tried to include all possible environmental factors that might be related to this neurological um, syndrome of unknown cause. And if um, during the process of um, clinical uh, review, if the neurologist, they could identify there might be some other possible causes or factors which might be, um, which have the potentiality to be a risk factor, then um, with the recommendation from the oversight committee, um, there is a possibility of investigating more. 
case. Thank you. Ms. Hogarth, do you have a follow-up? Yes, I'm wondering, have there been any significant reports of unhealthy animals or wild, wildlife from the area? And are we doing autopsies of animals to see if maybe we can find this um, outside of humans, something that would, uh, would give us more information? So uh, from the epidemiological report, um, the researchers have not uh, identified that any um, animal related disease or any animal exposure might be a potential factor. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Ms. Hogarth. Thanks. Thank you, Doctor. David Coach, Brunswick News. Okay, thank you. Um, a question from the minister. Um, I'm just going back to the role of, of Dr. Marrero. Uh, he was previously identified as leading the investigation. Um, what his, is his role now and how has it evolved in the last uh, few months? I'll take a stab at this, but Dr. Banville may want to uh, correct me if I'm not if I'm not right. Dr. Um, Marrero is a neurologist practicing in the province of New Brunswick, and he is uh, also uh, aligned with the Mind Clinic um, as uh, as the neurologist there. Mr. Coach, do you have a follow up? Um, well, I, I I mean, could could you explain the ch the change in his role? after he was being previously identified by, by by the health authority, I believe, of leading the investigation, his role has, has now evolved. Could you, could you explain uh, why his role evolved in such a way? And, and also, um, just the, the, the six patients who have died, uh, it's been updated today to nine patients. When did the last three patients die and why, wasn't, why weren't their deaths disclosed earlier? So that was a two for one. So we will try for the first one. So um, Dr. Marrero was was not the lead on this investigation. Public health was the lead on this investigation. And I think um, you can appreciate that when when an investigation into a potential cluster of neurological syndrome is taking place, it should be from an unbiased perspective. And so that's why public health not only put in, in place the epidemiological enhanced survey, but also the oversight committee with, um, with six neurologists not connected with the patients that were being seen so that there, there could be an unbiased perspective uh, injected into all of the cases. Sorry, could I get get a response on the second part of the question, which was about the deaths? There were six, and now it's nine uh, today on your on your website. When when did those last three die, and and why wasn't this disclosed until today? We we don't have that information here, but we will get that for you. What I can say is that six out of the of the nine were the original forty eight cluster, and that's why we knew of the six. Nicolas Steinbach, Radio Canada. Bonjour, j'ai posé ma question en anglais et en français, et ce serait possible d'avoir une réponse en anglais et en français aussi, s'il vous plaît. Euh, à partir des résultats des autopsies, à partir des résultats du rapport qui a été dévoilé aujourd'hui, est-ce que vous estimez que le docteur Marrero a fair error based on the findings of the autopsies revealed yesterday and on the report revealed today do you think dr marrero is mistaken Avec les évidences qui viennent d'être révélées aujourd'hui, nous allons devoir nous asseoir avec Dr. Marrero et réviser les dossiers, discuter avec lui. Euh, on ne peut pas faire des commentaires avant d'avoir discuté avec lui. Can you say that in English? Uh, based on what, or, what... or Dr. Shepard, as you, or Minister Shepard, as you wish. 
Uh, no, uh, based with what uh, was uh, revealed today, uh, we will have to discuss with Dr. Mario and uh, sit with him. We cannot make any more comment without talking with him. Monsieur Steinbach, as une deuxième question aujourd'hui? S'il vous plaît, merci, Bruce. Uh, par rapport à la maladie neurologique de sources inconnues, est-ce que la province ou peu importe, une autre, euh, une autre agence fédérale ou provinciale a procédé à des tests environnementaux, que ce soit par exemple sur les fruits de mer, que ce soit sur les algues bleues, que ce soit sur les cervidés. Est-ce qu'il y a eu sur le terrain, depuis qu'on est au courant qu'il y a potentiellement une nouvelle maladie au Nouveau-Brunswick, est-ce qu'il y a eu des tests environnementaux? Oui ou non? Throughout this investigation and as an ongoing practice with Department of uh, Fisheries and Oceans, um, Department of Agriculture, Aquaculture and Fisheries, they are um, constantly monitoring. Uh, the epidemiological survey did not call, uh, I don't believe, perhaps Dr. Raman can correct me if I'm wrong, but the enhanced epidemiological survey did not call for any additional testing that I'm aware of. Um, if the clinical team w wishes to, um, to have tests completed, if they feel it's warranted, they will certainly be, ca be, be, uh, be done. Merci beaucoup. Laura Brown, CTV. Following up on uh, Mr. Steinbeck's question, the word misdiagnosis has been used in these questions. I'm wondering, is this a misdiagnosis at this time, or are you investigating it as a misdiagnosis? Again, if any of my professional colleagues need to correct me, please, please feel free to do so. Um, we cannot predetermine the outcome of the, cl of the clinical part of this because it's too important. They, um, the, the neurologists that are, that are part of this committee, the oversight committee with Dr. Breen and Dr. Banville, they have to submit a report that gives us some of their findings. And so it would be irresponsible of us to predetermine the outcome. And so we are going at this from a uh, virgin approach that the information that they are getting is being reviewed with new perspective, clean perspective, and we will, uh, we will take their lead on this. So misdiagnosis could be on the table, though? Certainly. Uh, the, the whole purpose of this, um, this investigation was to understand, um, was to validate the potential cluster of unknown neurological syndrome, or if there was potentially other diagnosis. And on that, um, I'm wondering if right now today, maybe one of the healthcare professionals in the room can answer this. Um, if you were speaking to one of the families today, you're the referring physician. Sorry, I'm in the room, that's probably why that's happening. Um, you're the referring physician and you're speaking to one of the families or one of the patients today. What would you tell them? What is the, the best information you can give them on what's happening to them? Je peux répondre en français? Oui. Right. OK. Euh, je ne peux pas vous dire ce que je dirais présentement. Je dois avoir le rapport, la famille, discuter avec la famille, parler avec eux, présumer ce que je vais dire à une famille. Je n'ai pas un rapport. Je ne peux pas faire d'assomption sur le diagnostic. Je dois avoir un rapport. Comme médecin, quand on a eu des discussions avec notre famille, Par la suite, on rencontre, on rencontre la famille, donne un rapport d'autopsie. Je ne peux pas dire, de dire qu'est-ce que je leur dirais présentement, ça sentirait 
préenregistré. On doit s'adapter à la situation, faire un discours clinique avec la famille, leur expliquer ce qu'on a avec les résultats. I don't know if you understand, but I cannot make an, an answer what I would say to the family right now. You have to have the report, what you told the family before, what are you going to tell them now with what you know. I cannot have a pre-write result. It's all dependent from each family. It's going to be a different uh, conversation. Thank you. We're now going to go to Lisa Ellenwood with CBC. Hello there. I hope you can hear me. Lisa, a little louder, Hello? please. Hello. Okay. Can you can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so I have a question for Minister Shepard. Um, I am wondering if you can tell us who gave Dr. Jansen authority to publicly release the autopsy information. I have, um, I'm sorry, I don't have any knowledge of who would have done that. It didn't come from us. Do you have a follow up, Ms. Ellenwood? Yeah, I'm just wondering also if you can um, tell us, we know that some families um, of patients who died have still not been informed That concludes today's neurological syndrome update for New Brunswick. I almost said COVID-19 update there. Uh, the COVID-19 numbers did come in for today, though. Many of you were asking online at, uh, during the conference. So there are 57 new cases today and one new death, a person age 90 and over. All that information is on our Facebook page as well. I've posted a link to the entire study that was talked about in today's conference. Now, I believe it was a total of 38 people who've had this neurological syndrome who participated in the study. So if you have your own questions, I was trying to take a look during the conference. There, there's a lot of information in there um, in terms of food and environmental factors. For instance, I just mentioned this online, but 92% of the people in this study had had lobster within the last two years. 47% had had moose meat within the last two years. So uh, it obviously brings up a lot of questions um, with the idea that they're ruling out um, food and environmental factors today. Well, take a look at that study and, and come up with some of your own questions. I'd love to hear your feedback. Feel free to message us on Facebook or send us an email to news at chco.tv just with your um, general uh, feedback from this report. I would appreciate hearing from you. I will join you again soon. I am Vicki Hogarth at the CHCO News Desk. Thanks for joining us today. This has been a news and public affairs production of CHCO-TV, New Brunswick's only source for independent community television.